welcome dear participants in today's module we shall discuss a young scholar emily cox palmer white specializing in gender theory science fiction and philosophy response towards latest technological interventions and in biopower in terms of gender is still a developing approach it is in a nascent phase in continuation with our previous discussions this module will help us to understand gender as a biopolitical phenomenon dr emily cox palmer white explores the relationship between gender theory post humanism and female robots in science fiction and real world technology her latest work the biopolitics of gender in science fiction feminism and female machine is published by rootley in 2021 white analyzes representations of the female cyborg figure the gynoid in science fiction literature television film and video games she was awarded the peter nichols essay prize by the science fiction foundation for her paper denuding the gynoid her latest work the biopolitics of gender in science fiction is concerned with developing new avenues in feminist philosophy she draws together the work of key feminist and gender theorists such as judith butler and donna haraway and the biopolitical philosophy of giorgio agamben and gilles deleuze white's work the biopolitics of gender in science fiction is concerned with developing new avenues in feminist philosophy in her analysis white acknowledges the normative and subversive properties of the gynoid she calls for a new feminist politics of selfhood and autonomy implied by the post human qualities of the female machine in order to understand white's approach to science fiction gender and biopower we will be looking at a specific chapter in her book titled as women or woman kind signatures suspension and bare life in feminism and science fiction this chapter interprets gender as a defining part of one's identity while foregrounding the concept of biopower and giorgio agamben's concept of paradigmatic system the author outlines new conceptualization of gender as a category as a discourse and also as a knowledge while contextualizing ideas of biopower white reworks giorgio agamben's concept of paradigmatic system to approach the structures of gender as a biopolitical phenomenon she uses accounts by judith butler jack helbstrom and monique wittig to explicate the power structures embedded within the discourses of gender and sex to begin her account white refers to the concept of paradigmatic system proposed by the famous italian critic giorgio agamben agamben is one of the leading figures in philosophy and political theory his work however does not follow a straightforward chronological path of development either conceptually or thematically his central focus is on questions of language and representation politics of the spectacle and the ethos of humanity agamben is particularly known for his homo sacer project which begins with the book homo sacer sovereign power and bare life published in 1995 the project is a response to questions surrounding totalitarianism and biopolitics the term agamben has used for power structures is paradigms paradigms according to him are fluid categories constructed both socially and politically they are recognized in the real as well as virtual world and therefore are capable of radical change as a result of their unstable nature the paradigm is a part a fragment of the whole excluded from the whole in order to show its belonging to it in a way the fragment could be as a kind of paradigm for the whole the paradigm is a singular object that is standing equally for all others of the same class defines the intelligibility of the group of which it is a part 
and which at the same time it constitutes. In the next slide, we have an explanation of the term paradigms by Agamben. He defines paradigm as a form of an example which forms a scientific discourse. It is a system of rules or singularity which guides an investigation. In the second sense, the paradigm is a single element of the whole, let's say for instance Newton's Principia, which acting as a common model or an example, paradigm means just example as you know, stands for the explicit rules and thus defines a coherent tradition of investigation. Uh, thus, the question is for Kuhn to investigate by means of the paradigm what makes possible the constitution of what he calls a normal science. That is to say, a science which can decide if a certain problem will be considered scientific or not. And normal science uh, does not mean at all, uh, in the sense, a science guided by a coherent system of rules. On the contrary, the rules can be derived from the paradigms, but the paradigms can, gui quote, can guide the investigation also in absence of rules. And this is precisely the second meaning of the term paradigm, which Kuhn considered the most new and profound, though it is the oldest in, in truth. The paradigm is, in this sense, just an example, a single phenomenon, a singularity, which can be repeated and thus acquires the capability of tacitly modeling the behavior and the practice of scientists. White uses this concept to approach the structure of gender as a biopolitical phenomenon. The paradigm is composed of an opposition, one of Agamben's most famous examples is the opposition of politics in biology in the paradigm of life. He traces it back to the ancient Greek concept of bios and zo. However, the implications of biopolitics in the context of sex and gender have not been at all taken up by Agamben. White marries the two to outline the engagement of gender and sexuality, self and the other, power and knowledge. And for her, biopolitics and gender are closely related to each other. White argues that the essence of life can be divided into public political life and private domination over one's biological existence. However, the processes of sexual reproduction are dictated by the systems of heteronormativity. We can look at certain examples to further understand this concept. The trans people face difficulty to legally change their gender status in several countries. There are legalities and illegalities related with the geographical location and associated with the LGBTQIA plus community across globe. Cyberbullying of men and women for not being masculine or feminine, respectively, and vice versa. Surrogacy practices for men, women, and homosexual couples. And very recently, linked with White's arguments, we can also refer to instances of abuse and violence in metaverse. In viewing gender as a paradigm, the man is constructed as a universal case, and the other always is an aspect of self-made problematic. White points out that in his discussions, Agamben leaves out these significant implications of biopolitics in relation to state regulations of sex and gender. And she attempts to utilize this theoretical gap using Agamben's concept of paradigmatic system to understand the relation between sex and gender as discursive constructs embedded in the domain of biopolitics and power relations. We may imagine that life has two independent parts, public and personal, and that we may control our choices in terms of biological processes. But in reality, the state is invested in regulating our biological processes, namely sexual reproduction, 
through phallocentric ideals and homosocial norms. We have already its examples, for example, difficulties faced by the transgender people in changing their gender status in certain countries. In order to understand the intertwined nature of biopolitics and gender relations, White chooses to situate the two concepts into the fantastical realm of the science fiction writing. White opines that science fiction writing contributes heavily to the discourses of gender and therefore science fiction can be categorized as biopolitical fiction. This cross-sectional engagement between biopolitics, science fiction and gender theory is part of many works of science fiction literature. It is often seen that in the conceptualization of human subjectivity, woman is constructed as the inferior and in service of male supremacy. The categories of male and female can also be mapped onto the binary of zoe and bios within the paradigm of life and referred to by Agamben in his illustration of paradigm, with men seen as constituting political public life while woman is associated with the sphere of the domestic, private life and crucially biological life, in a dystopian reading, we can also think of violence against women. White also quotes Cheryl Wind's Bodies of Tomorrow to elaborate on the relevance of the science fiction universe. Gender is truly suspended between the categories of male and female, very much like the concept of life and the distinctions between the two become blurred. Science fiction deals with aliens, zombies, animals and more to mark the discourse of the self and the other. Cheryl Wint, professor of science fiction media studies at universities of California, argues in her 2007 work Bodies of Tomorrow that science fiction is particularly suited to, and I quote, Exploring the question of the post-human because it is a discourse that allows us to concretely imagine bodies and selves otherwise. A discourse defined by its ability to estrange our commonplace perception of reality." Unquote. Science fiction, particularly when it deals explicitly with concepts of sex and gender, is biopolitical fiction. Wint acknowledges that the new selves science fiction might help us imagine are both the problematic selves and the unexpected others. Agamben's understanding of the paradigm reflects the existence of the binaries, the dichotomy of the biological self and the universal public persona or digital avatar that is the self and the other. White also quotes, Jack Helberstrom's understanding of gender paradigms from her work Female Masculinities, while foregrounding the fluidity of the paradigms as proposed by Ekambin. The paradigm is a theoretical knowledge system which fosters intelligibility. Here it allows us to understand the complexities of gender and a categorical situatedness of women. White notes that paradigms have the tendency to sometimes supersede its representation and this can be considered true in the understanding of gender as one cannot contain the meaning or the meanings of the terms masculine and feminine or men and women. To quote Jack Helberstrom, virtually nobody fits the definitions of male and female. The categories gain power and currency from their impossibility. In other words, the very flexibility and elasticity of the terms man and woman ensures their longevity. Interestingly, Agamben observes that paradigms are fluid, malleable and ever self-evolving. They constitute culture and the individual as a whole and a collective. White quotes Agamben that the historicity of the paradigm lies neither in diachrony nor in synchrony, but in the crossing of the two and moves from singularity to singularity. However, the irony of the situation is that there is a lot of ambiguity with respect to gender identities and gender performance that disrupt the operation of the gender paradigm. 
Halber Stem notes that while some present almost formulaic presentations of gender, some leave it to context and are totally ambiguous. In analyzing such codes of gender performance, the paradigms perpetuate myths, norms and functions in the society. They also transform according to place, community and people and are absolutely subjective. To substantiate her argument further, White quotes the example of Nemocene, named after the Greek goddess of memory. It is a visual art atlas by the German art historian Ebi Warburg. It contains almost 1000 images from books, magazines, newspaper articles and other daily life sources. They are arranged thematically on 40 wooden panels covered with black cloth. Agamben has analyzed it to elaborate on the concept of the paradigm in operation as a marker of dynamism, subjectivity and evolution. Agamben quotes the example of Ebi Warburg's Nemocin in order to elaborate the particulars of the process of building or rebuilding paradigms. Plate 46 of this atlas in particular contained various visual representations of the nymph which is neither singular nor multiple, neither archaic nor contemporary. As one continues to read this representation and will continue to do so, the image becomes the paradigm in operation. It evolves due to continuous reading. Another way to read Abby Warburg's work is to see that the image of the nymph is both an individual representation and is being represented and read within the paradigms of the virtual art atlas which has been created. The image represents a collective and at the same time a singularity. White observes that Ekumpen's analysis of the nymph implies an inherent instability within our method of organizing knowledge, whereby general and specific instances within the paradigmatic become blurred so that there can be no origin. The existence of the nymph is predicated on a fluctuation of collated concepts that all oscillate between the general and particular in that the common that is the general contains properties of the proper that is a single instance in vice versa producing an indistinction within the paradigm of nymph. Why treats the fluidity of the image of the nymph within and across the discourse of gender? In considering Agamben's nymph paradigm, one can also understand gender and its function in a similar fashion. There is no actual original man or woman that can be said to represent all other members of the group. Rather, gender constitutes a complex self-enforcing practice that emerges from Evicote Butler, the repeated stylization of the body, a set of repeated acts within a highly rigid frame that congeal over time to produce the appearance of substance. Woman as a category is both singular and universal. However, we witness this category uniquely suspended due to her position that is constructed fellow-centric and almost determined by men in a broader paradigm of gender as a whole that envisages all female as subordinate entities. Woman itself is a term in process, a becoming, a constructing that cannot rightfully be said to originate or to end. White focuses on the female characters such as Shakespeare's Lady Macbeth, Jane Eyre's Ghost Like Bertha, as such characters were created to showcase ambiguity, fear and unrest. A certain sort of madness was associated with such characters. Interestingly, such characters, when read in the domain of science fiction literature, personify anxieties and uncertainties through the figure or the figuration of a woman. The problematic spaces signaled by gender are crucial to the imaginings of the science fiction. White asserts that the fluid female characters have always threatened 
our socio-cultural norms. However, within the paradigm of the science fiction, they experience either extreme marginalization in the context of a dystopia or complete freedom in the context of a utopia. The presence of women, whether actual, threatened or symbolically represented through the alien or mother earth, for example, reflects cultural anxieties about a range of others imminent in even the most scientifically pure and technically focused science fiction. The categories of self and other dichotomies presented within the discourse of gender are presented and represented, produced and reproduced by the figure of the female character in several science fiction narratives. Oviman represented the unknown, the mystical, which can be deeply internal to the human psyche and yet utterly divorced from the anthropocentric. It is the extraterrestrial or the extrahuman, the alien, both literally and figuratively, the monstrous other that is both central to human understanding and yet also probably outside the limits of human comprehension. So, White has made this statement to clarify how the presence of a woman can have a gendered existence even in the domain of science fiction. Further, White quotes Irigere's speculum of the other woman to showcase the redundancy experienced by the female self with respect to the male narrative. Irigere describes women as a pure mimicry, which is always the case for inferior species as she has commented. She also goes on to say, and I quote, needed to define essences, her function requires that she herself have no definition, unquote. Irigere's analysis is essential to deconstruct the stigmatization associated with women's entire being and existence. Further, such an understanding of women marginalizes queer and trans identities, even further the theoretical and literary hierarchy. On the other hand, Jack Halberstam observes that, and I quote, female masculinity is generally received by hetero and homonormative cultures as a pathological sign of misidentification and maladjustment, as a longing to be and to have a power that is always just out of reach, unquote. White unifies Irregares and Halberstam's approach to state that we need to demolish the essentialist approach to gender, the woman, the trans, the queer, and more to produce a variety of cultural narratives, associations, and identities. According to White, woman is not a fixity. It is a paradigm which take into account the experiences of being a woman and becoming a woman. White treats Jack Helberstrom and Irigere in an intertwined fashion to propose that the category woman is a fluid category and therefore can be categorized as an Agambian paradigm. She also illustrates this point with an analysis of a science fiction novel, Salaries by Eastern Lamb. In this novel, the female character Rhea or Harry's supernatural presence is dictated by her former partner Kelvin's memory of her. The novel is set in an extraterrestrial space escape and White analyzes it as a narrative of otherness, loneliness, misery experienced by the female self being attached to the male self as a naturalized binary opposition. White presents the case of Stanislaw Lamb's salaries to foreground the portrayal of otherness experienced by the female in a science fiction setup of a mysterious planet with the name of Solaris. In an attempt to communicate with extraterrestrial life, Dr. Kelvin, who is a psychologist and also a protagonist of the novel, bombards the land with high energy X-rays. The experiment fails, but afterwards everyone begins to experience certain hauntings and visitations. Kelvin's visitor is a look alike of his dead partner Rhea, who had committed suicide. She is the only real thing that 
Kelvin remembers. As a memory, Rhea is only as real as Kelvin remembers her to be. She is a figment of his imagination and the readers are never given adequate information about the relationship between Rhea and Kelvin. She holds the in-between transitional space between being a woman that is the universal and her individual distinct self which is the specific, the categorical like the nymph we have mentioned previously. Rhea is presented as a societal and volatile person and disparate with the constant compulsion to remain in Calvin's presence. The novel mentions that every visitor must stay in close proximity to the person who has conjured them, which interestingly also exposes a larger paradigm of gender. As the presence of Rhea and her entire existence is controlled by Kelvin and is constructed as a subordinated entity. Her very being is predicated on the imagination of man and his ability to envision her. Composed of moments of identity and difference, that is the dichotomy between the common and the proper, the founding principle as White comments in the specific instance which arises from it and can therefore also be seen as a subordinate to it. The paradigm can be said to consist of both the example and the exclusion. Rhea is constructed as a floating example, a kind of non-being devoid of any kind of literal depth and she eventually finds that she is unable to live as she is a mere shadow of a diseased woman and just like the original Rhea, she also ends her life. The novel has been subjected to various retellings and adaptations, audio as well as video. It has been adapted in radio, in theatres, operas and cinemas. In the next slide, we have a video clipping. It is an excerpt from the 2002 film adaptation of the novel, which is also titled as Solaris. This film is directed by Steven Soderbergh and it stars George Clooney as Dr. Kelvin and Natasha McElhone as Rhea. In this excerpt, Kelvin claims that he does not remember Rhea and what he remembered her wrong. These words echo throughout White's analysis as she observes that since this relationship is based on Kelvin's non-remembrance, Rhea will never become whole, a complete signifier or an individual capable of asserting agency and choice. She is a floating, suspended signifier, somewhere in between existing only in Calvin's memory and the non-existence as she dies in the text. It suggests a sense of loss of the female self in the novel as well as in the movie. Earth. Even the word sounded strange to me now. Unfamiliar. How long had I been gone? How long had I been back? Did it matter? I tried to find the rhythm of the world where I used to live. I followed the current. I was silent, attentive. I made a conscious effort to smile, nod, stand, and perform the millions of gestures that constitute life on Earth. I studied these gestures until they became reflexes again. I was haunted by the idea that I remembered her wrong. That somehow I was wrong about everything. After establishing the socio-cultural marginalization of the female subject, White now shifts to Monique Wittig's essay 
homo sum to assert the aforementioned in the linguistic domain as a holistic understanding of the violence experienced by the she as it amounts to a better understanding of the biopolitics of the gendered beings and bodies. In her essay, Homo Sum, Wittig analyzes language as it has ingrained assumptions of the supremacy of man over woman. Wittig's understanding of gender as primarily a linguistic apparatus is exemplified by the common phrase, mankind, where the exemplar of man stands for all humans, obscuring the very existence of women through blunt absence. Wittig posits that the first table of opposites which history has handed down to us has been recorded by Aristotle in his Metaphysics. She refers to certain examples also, for example, limited, unlimited, rest, motion, odd, even, light, dark, good, bad, male, female, one and many. Under the series of the one, the absolute being non-divided, divinity itself, we have male and light that were from then on never dislodged from their dominant position. Under the other series appear the unrestful, the common people, the females, the slaves, all reduced to the parameter of non-being. For being is being good, male is straight, in other words, godlike, while non-being is being anything else, female. It may mean discord, unrest, dark and bad. Monique's work provides a more constructionist position with respect to gender. Language plays a key role in constructing an imbalance between sexes and produces a gendered hierarchy. White suggests that as women are constructed in relation to men through language, categories do not exist outside of the heteronormative patriarchal order that has been founded on the fiction of oppositional discourse. Woman as a category is not simply confined to her status as the other, but rather her marginalized status is produced through her being caught between her position as proper and as an exact reflection of men's desire, the common. According to White, though considered inferior and thus holding the position of the excluded within the gender paradigm of patriarchy, woman is also in some sense included in the rule by virtue of her dichotomous position. The contradiction represents the paradigm's inherent instability to produce the non-being of the woman which Wittig has written about. Therefore, we witness the category of the woman as a paradigm which holds true for the trans as well as for the queer identities too. In this segment, we discussed White's analysis of the being and becoming of the woman and the womankind. While explaining the intricacies of the paradigm as a literary concept, White asserts that gender should be categorized as a paradigm due to its dynamic characterization. To explicate this assertion further, she uses the discourse of science fiction as it contributes heavily to the understanding of both a gender neutral future in the context of a utopia and violence based on gender in the context of dystopia. White's intersectional approach alludes to science fiction as a literary apparatus for experimentation. Her analysis of Solaris demonstrates that gender as a construct is a paradigm capable of accommodating the diversity of beings and becomings and prone to the biopolitics of ideology and repression. White explores gender as a biopolitical tool through language by referring to Monique Wittig, expounding that language is an essential part of the process of othering. In the next segment, we will discuss how White explores the socio-political othering of women and gendering of bodies by foregrounding the TV series The Handmaid's Tale. This TV series is based on the famous novel of the same name by Margaret Atwood. This analysis will help us to have a more cohesive understanding of gender 
एज ए बायोपोलिटिकल फिनोमिनल थैंक यू